So folks, uh, well, please grab a uh, copy of the handout that's going around. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the sponsor of the conference, uh, <coughs> Dr. Bill Freeberg, and the organizer of the conference, uh, Dr. Svi Stamper, for giving me the uh, opportunity to uh, present a couple of times. Uh, what I would like to do with my time today, once uh, the copies of the handout get circulated, is take some of what uh, Daniel has presented to us about uh, the idea of contradictions and how contradictions play into, uh, in evidence, play into adjudication, and turn the locus of uh, examination from the two witnesses onto the single witness himself. All right. So instead of looking at how the two witnesses might contradict one another, uh, we are going to where we're going to get in this presentation is uh, to how important it is specifically to Maimonides that the single witness understand that when he says X, that he is not saying not X. Okay? That the very idea of making a positive statement means you are not saying the opposite itself. That's where we're going to go in the presentation. And I'm going to suggest that Maimonides' source for this uh, very much like uh, Tzvi's presentation, is, uh, is from Aristotle. And Aristotle's epistemological framework for how we can know anything. Because what the Jewish court is trying to do is to establish something, therefore it's going to consider how we might know. All right? So when we think about how we might know, we're going to start by looking at Maimonides' Islamic context. Okay? And uh, we'll start with a little piece from uh, from Intisar Rab's recent uh, article about what she calls reasonable doubt in Islamic law. And unlike our, uh, our other presentations, because this is a workshop, I'm going to get you folks to read our texts out loud. Exactly. Let me get a volunteer to read a piece from Intisar's article. Uh, this is in English, so you can, you know, obviously Let me get a volunteer, folks. There we go, you need, please. In English, right? Please. <laughs> you can read in German, too, but I don't think it's been translated. A combination of strict textualism and divine legislative supremacy left no obvious mechanism or need for Muslim judges to acknowledge, much less, much less accommodate doubt. The history of Islamic notions of doubt reveals how central social, political, and institutional contexts were to Muslim jurists' constructions of Islamic law in this purportedly textualist legal tradition. I have argued that Muslim jurists developed a textual doctrine of doubt in response to the 11th century political context of an excessive state violence that accompanied the breakup of the empire and weakening of institutional structures for which they sought to systematize the law. These jurists managed to convert a judicial practice expressing a preference for recognizing doubt in order to avoid dubious punishments into a foundational text requiring it. Okay, so what uh, Intisar is arguing here is that a system which has some very clear penalties laid out in the Quran for specific crimes, let's say murder, uh, um, um, uh, for, uh, for um, fornication, adultery, for... Uh, um, uh, Wine. Sorry? Wine. Wine, sure. For wine, um, th yes, exactly. And so on, right? The system, right, creates the institution of doubt for, uh, at the, on a marginal case, right, pushing the punishment aside. The punishment is so clear the in the text. What's the term of doubt? Sorry? What's the term in Arabic of doubt? I'm not sure which term she's using here. Shuck. I'm sorry? Shuck. No, only shuk, 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 shuk. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, because I don't think she quotes it in, in the article, but what she is arguing here is that was, what was in the early stages simply a practice of judges eventually becomes a hadith, a text, which is ascribed to the prophet himself. So it builds into the system the idea of doubt, the possibility of doubt, and again, which what, something which was in the early stages, just the tendency of judges at the level of practice, becomes a formalized text. Now, what I'm going to argue here is that the uh, Jewish jurisprudence 
doesn't have to develop in this area like Islamic jurisprudence does because from its early stages here, from the Mishnah and, and obviously from the Talmud and so on, the idea of a vehicle for getting out of those explicit punishments is built into the system already. Okay, and so we'll see this a little bit here in, uh, in the case of the Mishnah. Let me get a volunteer to read this. Please read the Mishnah in the English books. Both monetary Please. and Thank capital you. cases have examination, drisha, and inquiry, chakira. As it is written, uh, you shall have one justice. What is the difference between monetary cases and capital cases? Monetary cases are tried with three judges and capital cases with 23. Monetary cases are opened either with arguments to acquit or to convict, and capital cases open with arguments to acquit, but do not open with arguments to convict. Monetary cases are decided by one either to acquit uh, or to convict. Capital cases are decided by one to acquit and by two to convict. In monetary cases, the verdict can change between acquittal and conviction. In capital cases, the verdict can change to acquittal, but cannot change to conviction. Okay, so what we're seeing in this text is in the case of, in capital cases, right, some of what, uh, what Intisar is arguing, the Islamic system needs to introduce this text, that what was, again, a judicial practice of pushing towards doubt, Right now becomes a text attributed to the prophet, to the prophet, right, leaning towards doubt. Here we have it built into the system that in capital cases there is a uh, there is a preference, if you will, uh, putting chinks in the evidence and leaning towards uh, leaning towards acquittal. Okay, this becomes uh, formalized in, uh, in in the Mishnah Torah, and uh, you'll you'll see it'll go perhaps even a little bit farther. Okay, so we have these various forms of inquiry that are put, uh, to which the witnesses are put. There is drisha, examination, and inquiry, hakira, and so on. And there's also this other thing called bidika. So what's the difference between these various strata of, uh, of uh, drisha, hakira, and bidika? The, uh, get a volunteer to read the Mishnah Torah in the English. And it continues on the second side. Please. Wonderful. Thank you. Shuba is the word for... Shuba. Great. What is the right. difference between Chakirat, Jerishat, and Bidika? With regard to Chakirat and Jerishat, if one witness gave specific testimony and the second said, I don't know, their testimony is of no consequence. Okay, so we have the sort of the higher level, let's say Chakirat and Jerishat. Right? So if one says, I don't know, right, so one gave specific testimony, the second says, I don't know, their testimony as a whole is nullified. All right, keep going. By contrast, with regard to Bidikot, even if both of them say, I don't know, their testimony is allowed to stand. Okay, so this is a little bit of a, uh, a lower le uh, level of proof, if you will. So even if they both say, I don't really know about that detail, then their testimony is allowed to stand. However, keep going. If, however, they contradict each other, even with regard to Bidikot, their testimony is nullified. All right, so here, right, where a contradiction comes in, even to this lower standard of what the data is, right, if the two contradict each other, their testimony is nullified. Now, this idea of contradiction, right, which was introduced in the first paper, is going to become very important in a moment when we look at the Mishnah Torah on a dut, on, uh, on what qualifies one to be a witness. Okay, but before we get there, let's look at the Sefer uh, Itur. Uh, right, Itur is going to describe who is fit to give testimony. It's got various categories. Okay, women and slaves, we know, and so on. Please, Nancy, please read. Women and slaves are invalid for testimony, though convert is acceptable, as it says in Bodhikama. A blind person, a deaf person, one who is non mentis, and a, comp a minor who are also invalid, invalid for testimony. Because a deaf person, one who is non mentis, and a minor, are not a fit mind. Alright, so the category is these folks who are not a fit mind, right? <laughs> so if you're if you're uh, if you're blind, if you're deaf, non compos mentis and a minor, right, in all those cases, right, you are uh, you know, la Okay, keep going, please. A blind person cannot retell what he has not seen. And people who are feeble minded and hasty and blind and deaf are not capable of understanding the principle behind their words, require examination and inquiry before the court since even they may fall into the category of those who are non mentis and not a fit mind. Okay, so this category of exactly what it is to be of fit mind is where Maimonides is going to expand, 
Okay, so let's see what he does. He's actually going to take this uh, and fit it under this category of pita imbioter, excessively feeble minded. All right, let me, uh, Amir, this is in English. Would you? Uh, could, no, uh, okay. People who are feeble minded and do not understand that matters contradict each other. Okay, this, folks, F. Scott Fitzgerald says that uh, the sign, the true sign of a first-rate intelligence is being able to comprehend two contradictory matters, to hold two contradictory matters in one's head at the same time. And yet here, Maimonides describes, right, the person who is essentially non capus mentis as the person who does not understand that matters contradict one another. I don't think he has F. Scott Fitzgerald in mind. I think what Maimonides has in mind is that if you say X, then you are not saying not x, okay? And therefore, not understanding that the fact of a contradiction can exist, that if you testify to something, you are by definition not testifying to its opposite, right? That is the very definition of what one who is not feeble-minded is. So that is a basic requirement for testimony, okay? Incapable of comprehending the concept is it would be comprehended by people at large, those are those who are, uh, are considered among those who are mentally unstable. So the very definition here of a good witness is one who understands that when one is making a positive statement, isn't just making a report on reality. One could see a photograph, okay, and the photograph could describe, maybe there's a clock in the back of the photograph, describing the time that a murder took place. Okay, but what Maimonides is saying is that uh, witnesses are not simply making a report on reality, but they are, by definition, saying X and not saying not X. And that is the human element in, uh, in interpreting that testimony. Therefore, the very definition of people who are feeble-minded are those people who don't understand that by making a report on reality, they are not saying that other thing that another witness might contradict them on. Okay, so just to close, uh, I think I found the source for this idea that, uh, that Maimonides comes up with. You can see it doesn't come from his predecessor, uh, the Itor, right, who has this idea of being labdene uh, dea mean who, right? But, but uh, Maimonides again takes it farther to specify exactly what it means not to be uh, ben dad in this case, right? And as I said, it's not to say X and not X at the same time. Let me get a volunteer to read Aristotle and you'll see how Maimonides seems to have incorporated it. For a principle which everyone must have to understand anything that is, is not a hypothesis. And that which everyone must know who knows anything, he must already have when he comes to a special study. Evidently, then, such a principle is the most certain of all. Which principle this is, let us proceed to say. Here goes. It is that the same attribute cannot at the same time belong and not belong to the same subject, and in the same respect. We must presuppose, to guard against dialectical objections, any further qualifications which might be added. This, then, is the most certain of all principles, since it answers to the definition given above. Okay, so again, what Aristotle is saying is the very fundamental uh, element of knowing something, right? This is epistemology, essentially, here in the metaphysics, right? That in order to know something, you have to know that you are not saying it's contradiction. Okay? And therefore, that is, again, by Maimonides, right, the very definition of what it means to be a good witness. So, uh, we have taken this idea that, uh, that Daniel has brought up, right, contradictory witnesses, and we've now located it in the individual. Okay? The individual has to be someone who knows that one is making a report of reality, and therefore, by definition, not reporting uh, its opposite. Thank you. Great. Uh, each one of you uh, finished before time, so we have time for uh, for discussion.